Okay, let me pray for us, and then we'll continue in our scripture reading and our sermon for today. Let's pray. Father, be with us as we open up your word once again. Be with uh, your servant as I preach uh, imperfectly, uh, full of flaws. I pray that your spirit would be gracious and kind to bring your eternal truths and impress them upon our hearts powerfully in a way that goes beyond the ability of anyone. And I pray, Father, that as we do so, you would show us Jesus and that those who are far from you will be welcomed home and those who are home may be built up in your likeness and that as a result, your body here on earth be, be, be um, built up for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, friends, uh, welcome again. Good morning. And today we are continuing in our series through the book of Acts. We're currently in chapter 9, and what we're about to read is a momentous moment in church history. It really is. Namely, we see here the conversion of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. And if you remember before this in our series in the book of Acts, uh, we studied, uh, before the book of Acts, we studied the book of Romans. A lot of you were with us for that. And if you didn't know, the guy who wrote, or who God used to write the book of Romans, and also really to write about 25% of the New Testament, is the Apostle Paul. Now, in our passage, we won't see his name as Paul yet. We'll see his name as Saul. And he wasn't an apostle yet in our passage today. He was actually a Christian killer. He was. If you remember, uh, Saul's name already came up once in the book of Acts, namely in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen, one of the church leaders, was stoned and executed to death. You remember that story in Acts chapter 7? If you read Acts chapter 7 again, you'll see that the guy who led up that execution was Saul, the guy that we're about to read about here in Acts chapter 9. Our passage today is about mercy. Our passage today is about heaven reaching down, not only to redeem, but also to recruit the worst of sinners, Saul. And if God did it to Saul, what our passage is trying to tell us is he can do it to you and to me and to anyone. How? Well, let's get into it. Let me read our passage first. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19a, and then, and then we'll get into it. But we'll read the whole passage, uh, but since Joe already preached on verses 1 to 6, I'm just going to mainly focus on verses 7 to 19a, okay? But we're still going to read the whole passage. This is God's Word, taken from Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19a. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter to the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there is a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a voice, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I'll show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. 
and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Thus says the Lord. There are three things that I want to point out from our passage today. First, no sinner too far. Second, no Christian too small. And third, no roadblock too great. No sinner too far, no Christian too small, and no roadblock too great. Let's start with our first point. No sinner too far. So Joe already talked about verses 1 and 6 last week, but I do want to emphasize again one thing from these first six verses, and that is just how, mount, how much Saul hated Christians. Okay, look at verse 1 again. It says that Saul was breathing threats and murder against Christians. Notice he wasn't just speaking threats and murder. He was breathing them. Imagine a wild animal bearing its fangs, breathing at you towards, uh, with murderous intent. That's Saul's attitude towards Christians. Okay, he, he, he was hunting them down. And he wasn't just satisfied with hunting Christians in the area that he was living in, in Israel. No, look at verse 2. He went all the way to Damascus, which was, by the way, 1,800 kilometers away from Jerusalem. Damascus was so far outside of Israel's borders uh, that Saul had to get uh, permission letters from the synagogues in that area because it's outside of his jurisdiction to hunt Christians down there. That's like the distance from Jakarta to Entete. East Timor. He would go that far to hunt Christians down. And not only that, this is what really did it for me. This is the crazy part. Saul put in all this effort. You know, he got permission letters. Uh, he traveled 1,800 kilometers outside of his area. He recruited po- people to go with him, not even knowing for sure that there were going to be Christians there. Look at verse 2 again. It says that he did all this so that if he found any belonging to the way, you know, just, just in case. <laughs> Maybe there's some there. I don't know. Let's just go check it out for good measure. He was that sold out to kill Christians. Men and women, verse 2 says, doesn't matter. If he finds them, he'll kill them both. Imagine someone in our culture today who's leading a movement to eradicate Christians. Picture that guy in your head on steroids, that Saul. But here's the amazing part of our passage. Here's God's mercy. Don't, don't miss this. As Saul was traveling to Damascus, verse 3 tells us, the risen Christ appeared to Saul and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, last week, Joe talked already about the significance of Jesus asking, Paul, asking Saul, why are you persecuting me, which shows how much the risen Christ associates with his people who are suffering here down on earth. That, that's profound. But I wanted to talk about today isn't necessarily what Jesus spoke to Saul, but it's when Jesus spoke to Saul. This is huge. When was it? When did Jesus speak to Saul and pursue Saul? It wasn't after Saul realized how sinful he was. It wasn't after Saul was repented over his sins. It wasn't while Saul was in some kind of church retreat somewhere. It wasn't while he was in Sunday morning service or while he was praying some kind of prayer. The risen Christ spoke to Saul while he was still in his murderous rampage while he was still swimming in the filth of his own sin. If you hear anything, hear this. Jesus does not work on your calendar. You know, I hear this a lot. People say, you know, I just, I don't know if I'm ready to receive Christ yet. You know, maybe later when I'm settled down, when my marriage is a little bit better, maybe when my addiction is gone, 
Maybe I'll, after I'm able to forgive this one guy, maybe when I stop smoking or whatever it is we consider here to be sinful, maybe when I'm able to cut off this romantic relationship that I know is displeasing to God, you know, then, then maybe I'll invite Jesus into my life. Invite Jesus? He doesn't work around your invitation. Don't miss what verse 1 says. Saul was still breathing murder. He was in the middle of bearing his fangs against Christ and the church. That's when Jesus interrupted his life. Yes, there's repentance and there's prayer and there's self-introspection that happened in Paul's life. That's what the blindness and the fasting in verses 8 to 9 was all about. He was without food and drink for three days. But all that happened after Christ interrupted his life, not before. Look, here's why I think perhaps the reason why many people's Christianity, it's half-hearted. I think it's because people view Christianity and doing things like what we're doing right now, going to church, following Jesus, we often view that just as a part of adulting. <laughs> you know, like it's just the next stage of, of life. It's just all a part of adulting. You know, I'll, I'll get there when I get there. You know, I'll, I'll get married. I'll get settled down. I'll hold a job. I'll follow Jesus. I'll go to church. It's the next step in my life. Well, if that's what you think is going on here, well, then no wonder your Christianity is half-hearted. The picture of salvation that we see in our passage today isn't God politely knocking on your door to see whether or not you're ready to grow up. It's him chasing us down while we're still in the depths of our despair. Like Saul, it's him stopping us in the middle of our path toward destruction, screaming into the graveyard of our souls, wake up. Arise from the dead and let the light of Christ shine upon you. That's salvation. God loves his people too much to quietly knock on their doors. He busts in and gives his beloved new hearts. No matter how far gone you think you are, no sinner is too far. No sinner is too far. Who is it that you perhaps have placed in that category of unreachable? Yourself? Your husband? Your wife? Your child? Your parents? A friend? No sinner is too far. God can reach him. And he could even use you to do it, which leads us to our second point. No Christian too small. If in verses 1 to 9, our passage focuses on Saul's conversion, verses 10 onwards, it focuses on a different person, a Christian who lives in Damascus hiding from Saul. His name is Ananias. By the way, just to clarify, this isn't the same Ananias that we saw in Acts chapter 5. Okay, Ananias was a common name back then, and we actually don't know much about this Ananias in Acts chapter 9. It's actually the first time he's ever mentioned, and we literally have no other information about him. F.F. F. Bruce, a commentator of the book of Acts, called this Ananias a private disciple, which really means he wasn't important. <laughs> it's a nice way of saying he has no public presence then. We don't know who this guy is. And now this should struck us as, as readers. It's meant to as a little weird, because think about the, the magnitude of what's happening in this passage in Acts chapter 9. Saul is getting converted. Saul, who will eventually become the Apostle Paul, who's going to write 25% of the New Testament, who started church planning movements that still continues today, who is arguably the single greatest evangelist this world has ever seen. And don't say Jesus is. Of course Jesus is. I'm talking about like a human being, a person. He's arguably the greatest human being that's the greatest evangelist ever lived. And, and who's the guy that led him to Christ? 
Ananias? Who's that? Why did God choose this random Christian who we know nothing about to do this amazing work? Look, some of us here may needed to hear what God had to tell us from Saul's story in verses 1 to 9, right? That, that he can reach the worst of us. But some of us who are here today, who may already be Christian, we need to hear what Christ is telling us through Ananias' story in verses 10 onwards. Yes, that God can reach the worst of us through the least of us. Whoever it was earlier that came to your mind under that category of hopeless, God can reach him through you. No sinners too far, no Christian too small. Now, let's be clear, like many of us, Ananias also had mixed feelings about the task. (laughs) He wasn't just ready to go. Yes, he said, here I am, Lord, at first, but then look at verse 11. God told Ananias what the task was. Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. I've given him a vision of your name and your face, and he's expecting you. Now, let's really get into Ananias' mind right now. Really try to imagine what he must be feeling. He knows Saul's reputation. He knows Saul led the execution of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He knew Saul is there in Damascus to kill Christians. And the first thing God told Ananias is that, hey, I gave him your name and your face. (laughs) He's probably thinking, oh, really? Thanks. You know, give him my address too while you're at it. (laughs) He wasn't happy about this. He's like, don't you know what he's here for? So Ananias starts to explain the situation to God in verse 13. Look, God, you've probably been busy, you know, not up with current events, but this guy is actually here to kill us. That's why he's in Damascus, as if God was lacking this data. And God responds to Ananias, just go, (laughs) just go. I know what I'm doing. It's not your job to speculate on how everything's going to turn out. Just obey me. Saul will be a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. So, verse 17, Ananias went there dutifully, as one commentator said, because his heart probably wasn't 100% in it, understandably so. And he met Saul there, the Saul. And he said, Brother Saul, Now, pause. Think about that for a moment. Imagine how hard it must have been for Ananias. This is the first time he would meet this world-class Christian killer who's murdered countless of Christians, some of them perhaps his very own friends. And the first thing he said to Saul was the word, brother, acknowledging that Saul is a part of the family now. Because through the blood of Christ, even the worst of us can be family. Brother Saul, and then look at what he said. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's it. That's all he said. He said what God told him to say, one short sentence, no flowery presentation, no fancy oratory technique. Adonis just simply repeated what God told him to say. He became God's mouthpiece. And then, just like that, he's out of the scene. He's gone, vanished, never to be heard of again, ever. But look at what that one quick, simple act of obedience done by a trembling Christian can do. Look at verse 18. Immediately, it says, Something like scales fell off Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. One quick, simple act of obedience done by a trembling Christian led a spiritual giant to Christ, a spiritual giant who God will then use to change the whole world for the gospel. There's a lot God's trying to tell us here. A commentator wrote this, Ananias enters and leaves the narrative, and we know nothing more of him. But he was Saul's first friend after his conversion, the first Christian to greet him as brother, 
as well as the first one who faithfully bore the Lord's commission to him. Ananias has an honored place in sacred history. There's at least two things we can learn here, two lessons from Ananias' story. First, if you're not preaching the gospel to that person who you've considered to be hopeless, the question is, why not? Why not? He can use the least of us to reach the worst of us. Go for it. But Tez, you don't know my husband. You don't know my wife. You don't know my kids. They're as stubborn as a rock. Maybe, but they're probably not leading worldwide massacres against Christianity. <laughs> if God can use Ananias, he could use Saul to bring them home. Sorry, if God can use Ananias to bring Saul home, he can use you to bring them home. The second lesson, I think this is really important. You know, why didn't God just tell Saul all this himself? Why did he have to use Ananias, this unknown Christian? And maybe this is for some of you here who are already Christians. You're already preaching the gospel, right, to these people. You're already preaching the gospel consistently. Maybe you're a Bible study leader, you're a community group leader, uh, you're a teacher at a Christian school, you're a ministry leader, you're a pastor somewhere. Then here's a lesson for us from Ananias' story. That we should have zero concern about getting credit for our labors. Zero. Zero. <laughs> we need to get that through this thick skull of ours. And I'm being harsher because I'm mainly speaking to myself. How many people remember us? Our legacy on earth, our name, it's not that important. We should aim to have our presence in this world to be like Ananias' presence in this story. The Christian's task, a theologian once said, is to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Preach the gospel, die, then be forgotten. Look, I'm not saying it's wrong for Christians to be remembered. There are tons of Christians whose work should be remembered, and it's helpful for the church. I'm just saying we're not the ones who should want it to be remembered. <laughs> That's not our concern because we're not in it for our legacy. We're in it for the name of Christ. And if you tell me that you're building up your own legacy for the sake of Christ because somehow through your legacy, the name of Christ will be magnified, then my answer to you is that addicts will use any excuse to justify their drug. Even ministry. We're all addicted to ourselves and we justify anything for a hit. The longer I've been in ministry, the more and more I'm convinced that the less Christians are concerned about their personal name or legacy on earth, the healthier the church will be. And the more Christians are, care about their personal name or legacy on earth, the more destructive the church becomes. You can't have it both. You just can't. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that what? Christ might increase. You can't have it both. So go. Live out the gospel. Share it. Even to those who you consider to be too far gone. And as you do so, do everything you can to put the spotlight on Christ and not on yourself. Is that going to be easy? Of course not. Absolutely not. We'll often feel scared like Ananias here, and we have tons of excuses like him too to not do it, which leads us to our last point. No roadblock too great. Now, what, what sticks out in the last part of this passage and really throughout the whole passage is the fact that any fear or difficulty or roadblock that a Christian might have in following God's call here to preach the gospel to others, it, it's removed. It really is. It's taken away. An example of a roadblock, for example, is that thinking because you're a young believer, you know, you just came to Christ, you don't have the authority to preach the gospel. Who am I, you might think? Well, take a look at verse 18 to 19. When was it that Saul was strengthened uh, it says, by God, to accomplish his mission. Verse 18 to 19, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Strengthened to do what? Well, to do the task that God is going to carry out from him. 
which is to magnify God's name. When did that happen? Right after he was baptized. Day one. Day one. Another roadblock might be, you know, I just I haven't gone to proper Bible training. I haven't gone to seminary somewhere, you know. So I don't have the authority to preach the gospel. And, and this is actually a huge passage, a huge point in our passage. You, you got to know that here in Acts chapter 9, this is interesting. This is the first time ever in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit was ever described to work outside of the geographical bounds of Israel. This is the first time. Before Acts chapter 9, the Holy Spirit would only work through the laying of the hands of an apostle inside of Jerusalem. But here, the Holy Spirit used the laying of the hands of a non-apostle, Ananias, and on top of that, it happened outside of Jerusalem. There's a huge point here that's often missed that God's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us that the Holy Spirit isn't bound up in some geographical location somewhere controlled by some holy group of people, like professors in a seminary or in a Bible college somewhere. Now, please don't misquote me and say, Tez said seminary and Bible school isn't important, okay? That is not what I'm saying. It is important. Of course it is. I went to one, and in fact, we need a lot more of it here in Indonesia. All I'm saying is that you're not disqualified as gospel sharers if you haven't gone to one. You're not. Give it a go. That's what God's saying. Give it a go. And let me show you what I can do even through the likes of you. But you don't know the likes of me, Tez. Some may still say. You don't know my past. You don't know how broken I've become. Well, here's the last thing I want to share from this passage. That's exactly the reservation Ananias had about Saul, right? He told God, God, do you know Saul's past? He's tortured and killed tons of people who call on your name, Ananias said. Notice that phrase, who call on your name. And look at how God responds to Ananias. Here's the answer. He said, don't worry. I'll show Saul how much he must suffer for the sake of of my name. Many commentators agree there's an intentional play on words going on there. There's a connection between Paul's past sins as a persecutor of Christ's name and his future work as a sufferer for Christ's name. What's the connection? Well, you gotta wonder, right? You got to think, how is it that the Apostle Paul was able to endure, if you know the story about his life at all, how is it that he's able to endure so much suffering for the name of Christ? Beatings, stoning, public shaming, unfair trials, and eventually death. How was he able to continue to endure and love and forgive those who persecuted him for the name of Christ? From this connection, I don't think it's a stretch to say it's because he remembers his past. I don't think it's a stretch to say that it's because during his stoning, when people were stoning him, he remembered how he stoned Stephen as well. And he remembered that Christ was crucified for my actions then. He forgave me for that. I can forgive these people who are stoning me as well. I don't think it's a stretch to say that while people were hunting him down, wanting to kill him, he remembered how he traveled 1,800 kilometers to Damascus to hunt Christians down as well and was reminded yet of a Savior who traveled even a greater distance from heaven to earth to die in his place. I can show these people who are hunting me down mercy as well, he must have thought. And while he was bound up unjustly for the gospel in Rome and many other places, imprisoned there, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he remembered his whole life. He's been unjustly bounding people up for the gospel. But then also of a Savior who willingly bound himself up on a cross for him. I can forgive these men too who are binding me up as well, he must have thought. Saul's broken past wasn't wasted by God. It was the very thing God used to vivify his love for him and propel him onwards in the mission. Guys, give it a go. Really, give it a go. Whatever flaw or roadblock that you think you have as a Christian that disqualifies you as a gospel sharer, whether you're a new believer, you're an old believer, you have a broken past, you lack training, whatever, 
give it a go. Take whoever that person is out of the unreachable pile of your heart because no sinner is too far. And then give it a go because you're not too small for God to use and none of your roadblocks are too great for him to overcome. The farther the sinner is to reach, the weaker the tool is whom God uses and the bigger the roadblock he overcomes, the more glory he gets and the more praise is due unto his name. So give it a go and see what the Holy Spirit might want to do even through the likes of you and me. Let's pray. Father, no one person should be sitting or standing or speaking or singing or praying in this room and feel like they deserve to do so because of their good deeds, past or current. We should all be here because like Saul, we've been stopped in our tracks. Because like Saul, we were bearing our fangs to the gospel, maybe not as violently, but bearing our fangs nonetheless. We viewed the cross as a excuse for easy religiosity. We've seen it as a cop-out for sinners who don't want to try. We've seen it as a way to justify um, our own uh, desire to sin. We've used all kind of excuses to hate upon the message of the cross. But yet, you stopped us in our tracks and you revealed to us the cross that is meant for us too. And that should leave us speechless, that should make us self-introspective, and it should also launch us in service of you. Help us, Father, your confused children, your flawed children. Help us as we do our best and serve this magnificent gospel message that we have been partakers of. And we pray for the people in whom we have considered to be unreachable, in whom we have considered to be hopeless. First, we repent for having such little hope of your power and mercy. And we beg you for the strength to go out and do our best as we, as we reach them with this amazing news that's changed our lives. Thank you, Father, for your son, for reaching unto us. Help us do the same unto others. In Jesus' name we pray.